I'm standing up here because, as my children say, though she be but small, yet she be fierce. So you can see me all the better up here. Well, if you've just heard Anthony Selden speaking, um, you'll know that he talked um, about happiness, amongst other things. And many of the things he covered, actually, he, uh, were the things that I myself was going to talk about. So I'm just going to rip up my speech here like that, because that's now redundant. And I'm going to address what the title of our talk is, how to improve your chances of success. And of course, being an English graduate, I immediately wanted to analyze the word and thought, what do we mean by success? And if we think about success, I suppose immediately we would think of material pleasures and uh, power and influence and status and connections. Uh, and yet there are two myths that we should address first of all. One is that material success leads to happiness. And the other one is that academic success leads to material wealth. We know that material wealth decreases in relation to academic qualification, perhaps, and happiness decreases in relation after a, uh, to increasing wealth after a certain level. But we look around us and we look at professions such as law, politics, and finance, and we think, well, there's a higher proportion there than you would expect of independently educated people. So surely it's really important that I get my child into one of these top schools that will uh, have my daughter or son on a career path through Oxford or Yale and on into one of those professions. But that world of law and politics is a vanishing one. We're not sending our children out into today's world. If you're looking now for a senior school place, it will be 10 or more years before your son or your daughter will be seeking to make his or her living. 10 years from now. Well, the world has changed so much in just the last five years. But in 10 years, what type of a world will we see? And what type of school, what curriculum, what environment will enable our children to be the innovators, designers, game changers and leaders of tomorrow. We already have robots uh, which are taking over many traditional jobs. We've got fridges that can order your food before you've run out. We've got little robots that will deliver your Amazon uh, package. Uh, and many of the traditional jobs in the workplace, sorry lawyers, accountants, are probably going to be on their way out and done by computers and software programs. Smart technology is the fastest growing industry. So that's the world that your child is going to go out into. And as Sir Anthony said before me, rather than simply looking at the league tables to see what is the right school for us, we should be thinking what skills, attitudes, values will my child need to be happy and successful and fulfilled and an asset to society. So, it is not shoehorning your child into the school which is highest up the examination league tables, which you, you should be thinking about. It's not about getting your child into a famous school with a prestigious name about which you could boast at a dinner party again, as Sir Anthony said. But we're all caught up in a toxic environment, particularly in, here in London, where there appear to be too few places for the number of children, where every school talks about the number of applicants for each place. In my own senior school, 10 applicants for every place. In my junior school, five applicants for every place. And inevitably, this creates huge anxiety, terrible worry um, for our children. And we all know about the crisis that there appears to be in mental health and well-being amongst children, particularly it has to be said amongst girls and especially in some of our leading, in other words at the top of those league tables, leading independent schools. But the anxiety is there to try to get our children into these schools because we still perhaps erroneously think that that will be the path that will make them happy and successful. So what do I see parents doing? Well, the first thing that they do, and is perhaps the main topic of, of our uh, conversation this afternoon, is to tutor their children. Now, I am not on either one side or the other of the tutoring debate. There is a place for tutoring. I'm very proud of the fact that my youngest daughter spends most of her evenings mentoring 
dyslexic children or children with special needs and those needs might be simply that they have come into the country with very little English. Helping those children, scaffolding them until such time as they feel confident and independent to go on alone. What concerns me greatly is that verb that I used earlier, shoehorning your child, pressurizing your child, trying to force your child into a school for which perhaps innately he or she is not best suited. And the sort of tutoring which um, drills a child again and again and again in endless practice papers, I think can be deeply damaging to a child's self-esteem. I'm also very concerned about what I hear are homework tutors, where children, having uh, finally got into that uh, favoured school, then struggles to keep up. And so the parents already paying fees for the child has to then pay sometimes for a whole raft of tutors, a math tutor, an English tutor, and this homework tutor. So the child doesn't have to worry about struggling with that math prep or that chemistry homework, but can simply hand it over to the tutor and it will of course come back to the school, probably almost correct. I'm deeply worrying that sometimes it's not 100% correct if these uh, highly qualified tutors are, are doing the homework. But what does it seem then to us to, on the school side? It appears to us that the child is effortlessly coping with the work. And then we get to exam time, the child takes the exam and crashes. And the parent storms into the school and says, what are you teaching my child? I've got tutors galore for her and she still managed to fail. And we say, but that is precisely the problem. You're not teaching your child or allowing your child to develop independent learning skills. Your child will know deep down that they are completely dependent upon the tutor for their results. They'll know they're not really doing it themselves. And this adds to the anxiety, the pressure that they feel as they approach exams. Now we'll come back to the tutoring question, I know, but I'm going to leave it there for the moment because I want to do, talk about other things that parents do to ensure success. They lie. I'm sorry, but it's true. Inevitably, in the fear that their child might not get uh, a place at the school, they will come to the head teacher and they will say that my child is basically a genius. Uh, she's an international swimming champion. He is certainly a budding Picasso. He is uh, an extraordinary um, inventor in the making. These things may be true, but so often when the child comes to the school, we find that they are indeed enthusiastic swimmers and, and very well able, but perhaps not at the international level which has been um, uh, described. And then the child, as with the academic side, feels they have an impossible hurdle which they have to um, jump over, or just a billing that they have to live up to, which makes them feel deeply anxious um, and inadequate. Now, it is also, there is a sort of urban myth that some parents bribe head teachers uh, to take children into their school. Well, it's true. Uh, I've, I have um, experienced this myself, not that the bribe has been successful, but there are instances where parents will feel that if they offer something to a head teacher, that there will be a special route into the school. The only thing that matters to me and matters to any head teacher is that my school is the right one for that child. And I'm not simply looking for a brain on legs and a child that will in some way force my school higher up those league tables. I'm wanting a child who is open, curious, enthusiastic about, loving, about learning and will thrive in an atmosphere which is challenging and aspirational but believes in the whole child and its well-being in every aspect. And the final thing, of course, parents do is panic. And we've all been there. I have four children who between them went to, I think, seven different schools, uh, which shows the desire that I had to find the right one for them. But panic will make the red fog come down, and we will then not be able to think clearly. And if you heard Anthony Selden's uh, talk, you will know the advice he gave about thinking clearly, listening to the head teacher, um, doing your research, etc. But I have four things that I would suggest that we should do as parents if we want to ensure success for our child in uh, her search or his search for the right school. The first one I'd say is know yourself. Ask yourself very clearly, what are my values? What do I really believe in? What do I hold most dear? What do I want most 
for my child. Now I think that whatever I might have said at the beginning about wealth, prosperity, material success, that if I said what you most want for your son, what you most want for your daughter, I think you will say, I want him, her, to be happy, to live a fulfilled life, to live a meaningful life, to have a purpose, to live a life which is not only, uh, make not, that he or she not only makes a good living, but lives a good life. So you need to make that clear to yourself that those are the things that matter most and seek a school which feels the same way about children, that also foregrounds uh, a life of service, that talks about loving children, that talks about the wonderful uniqueness of every child, and that they don't need to get into a box, but indeed think outside it, think differently, think bravely, and make a difference to the world. Secondly, know your child. As Sir Anthony said again, just because everybody else's child is going to a certain school, it shouldn't be the reason that you send your child there. Know your child. Of course we, we think our children are wonderful. Indeed they are in their own special way. My four are each totally different from each other. But know her strengths or know his weaknesses. Know what they're good at, but know their fragilities too. And look for a school that has the pastoral care which will understand your child's uh, frailties as well as seeing his wonderful potential. How very particular gifts. So know your child and let, let your child know that what matters to you is that they are in the place where they are nurtured and loved. Secondly, uh, sorry, thirdly and perhaps right at the beginning you need to know the market, you need to do all your research and what a wonderful opportunity this is to get out and see the types and variety of schools that are. All the schools here are good schools, every single one. We're subjected to rigorous inspection by the Independent Schools Inspectorate, which I'm an inspector myself. No school will be here, no school will survive the market forces unless it was good. So after we've established that, take your pick of a school that suits your child. And then know the school. Don't be fooled by the wonderful facilities, the glossy brooch brochures, the promises that they make. Look at the children. What are they like? Do they combine confidence with humility? Do they uh, combine uh, creativity with intellectual resilience? A good school should foster a love of learning and inquiry, a thirst to discover and uncover a sense of fun and creativity whether learning about the past or developing ideas about the future, an ability to innovate, collaborate, communicate, an awareness of diversity and difference, the courage to challenge and take risks, the humility to serve. So, as parents, perhaps your child is only three, and you're looking at this world in front of you, this journey that you should take. You're looking for a school to go on that journey with you. What can you do to help us in education to prepare your child for that world in 10 years time, or 15 if your child is just starting uh, junior school, how can you help? Well, first of all, that word, that L word, love, ensure that your child has as much of you as possible. Nothing else will do. Money will buy you the ability to bring in tutors, to bring in nannies and drivers and housekeepers and a host of material blessings in a wonderful home. All your child needs is you and your time and your unequivocal attention. And the more that you can do that in the early years of your child's life, the stronger, more resilient, more successful your child will be. Read and read and read more with your child. I've got one of my children here and he will tell you that I read with my children until at least they were 10. And we still read together. We read at Christmas where we all share poems and stories together when I get my lovely family back again. Read and read and engender in your child a love of the imaginative world. Ensure that they're creative uh, and that they have wonderful fun. Childhood should be about adventure, challenge. Don't helicopter your parent, your, your child. I know only too well the desire to make everything right for my children. My own life is quite a struggle in many ways. Uh, through the years of school and in my home life and so I wanted to make everything happy and uh, easy for my children. The temptation when they struggle is to leap in 
And if we have the money, we think money must be the answer. Bring in somebody to sort it. Struggle is vital to build resilience and to build success for the future. So after that, engage closely with your school. Listen, as Sir Anthony said to the head teacher, take advice and be guided. Do your homework and look more than anything at the leadership of the school. I couldn't have believed how much it is possible to transform a school until I came to the wonderful one where I was privileged to take over four and a bit years ago. Founded on wonderful ideals of Christian service and love and kindness and humility, it has been such a privilege to see it transformed even further by bringing in amazing staff who also believe that children must be given um, a, a place where they are nurtured, where they're challenged, where they are given a, a love of learning, resilience, grit, determination, creativity, innovation, all these things are what we um, hold most dear. So choose wisely with your child's well-being at the forefront of your mind. Not what others, um, uh, don't worry about what others will think of you and the status that that child will bring, just what is best for your child. And I have a, a quote at the end from Jean Piaget, who is one of the greatest um, uh, philosophers and psychologists and leaders in children's education. And he says, the principal goal of education should be creating men and women who are capable of doing new things, not simply repeating what other generations have done, that's us, men and women who are creative, inventive, and discoverers. The world needs our children to be those things. That is what success means. So I'm gonna hand over now to William, who will tell me how vital it is that your child is tutored. Uh, apologies, this might well be really repetitious because unlike Lucy, I didn't catch Sir Anthony Selden. I was busy, busy selling extortionate 10,000 hours of tuition to a little girl with sub-average intelligence for a place at Eton uh, downstairs. Um, but this is the thing. You're probably expecting some sort of battle royale. In fact, Lucy and I's ideas about tuition and education are pretty much the same, as are most of the people in this building. I am not, as some misinformed, very few, but some misinformed head teachers, some sort of practitioner of the dark arts of education. Um, I point out that, of course, tuition precedes formal schooling by about 2,000 years, but it's no biggie. Um, and, of course, there are places where it is very appropriate. There are places where it's very inappropriate. In terms of the success, everything that Lucy just said is correct. Panic, fear, parent paranoia, mass hysteria, they are all evil and bad news. When, and it is not very often, but when in my role as a consultant, school placement advisor, um, you know, very powerful, influential, well-to-do people with very serious brains on them, and you know, very good advice they've always had come to me, it's incredibly rare that they open with, I want my child to be happy. When they do, I practically give it our services for free because then I can show them what treats they have in this country across the education sector be it London countryside the rest of Great Britain boarding day selective non-selective liberal arts technical doesn't matter we can show them everything and they can choose and it is about personality it is about where is the school that is going to give an environment that your child's personality is going to flourish. Not be okay, not half the time they're going to like what they hear, but all of the time where possible. And you are all, certainly in the independent sector in this country, very lucky to be in Britain. The choice, even in this building, and this is well, it's quite a big fraction of the market, but it's still just a fraction of the market. But what's on offer in this country at the moment is, is historic. It's amazing, the choice, the selection. If you chuck away the paranoia about what you say at a dinner party to someone you think is important and should, you know, you should be staying at a certain school and someone else is saying it, so you should be saying it. This is not a handbag, a pair of shoes, an Hermes tie or a suit. This is a long, complex process 
education that your child will go through and you can make some really fantastic decisions. It's quite difficult in the private sector to make some bad decisions because the quality is so good across the board but you can make some really outstanding decisions with just a tiny amount of input. You don't have to do an awful lot. You have to be, as Lucy points out, a good parent. Know yourself, know your kids. But your kids, not what you think your kids should get. There is a huge problem, and it's a crisis with tuition. That is, it's a very accessible industry. It's largely unregulated, and pretty much anybody can put their hand up and say, I'm going to be a tutor. Now, pretty much anybody can't do that with me, but I'm afraid I don't represent, much as I might try, the entire marketplace. You know, a tutor can put a piece of paper on a notice board on a lamppost on Northcote Road, which I see around here with worrying frequency, just like a mobile number saying math teacher in sort of um, laminate. I'm sure lots of people phone and lots of people use them, some of them might be fantastic. Um, I'd be quite curious as to the faith of putting a stranger into my home that readily with my child, but do your homework if you're going to do tuition. Think about why you're doing it. If you feel that your child is not quite up to a certain school, do not get a tutor to get into that school. Look at your choice of school. Why are you pursuing something that has not been recommended by your head teacher? The first question I ask any of my consulting clients when they say, you know, oh, we want to go to these schools, and I haven't assessed their child at this point, and they're deciding whether or not to spend their hard-earned currency with me, is, have you spoken to your head teacher? Yes. Do they agree with your choices? No. Great. Neither will I. Because I'm going to assess your child, I'm going to look at them objectively, and we are going to come up with a list of schools that quite obviously, from what you've just told me, you're not going to agree with. So I'm not going to work with you. Now I'm very lucky, I get to do that because we've been doing this a long time and I am sure when we were starting out, we did not always do that. We had to get moving, we had to say yes when we probably should have said no, and we learned. But I now have the luxury of that experience and I can say no. There are young companies who perhaps don't do that often enough. You have to be your own watchdog. You have to do your homework on them. There is now a tutors association in this country. It has a very good code of ethics. It's President Adam Muckle is uh, around here today at the moment, and he is doing a very good job. He's just taken over his tenure. There are some big, the, the biggest agencies, the, the ones who are represented here today, uh, are all corporate members. But if you're getting an individual tutor, which is fine, it can often be cheaper, they're more accessible, they're more local, Ask them why they're not joining. Have they read their code of ethics? Okay, it's a very good starting point. Does your tutor have a CRB, a Criminal Records Bureau check? It's now called a DBS, apologies, Disclosure and Barring Service. Um, can't believe I actually passed mine, but anyway. It's very important to really just do the basic checks. Because for some reason, despite the fact this, is with your most, this involves your most precious asset in life ever, your kids, Parents seem to completely just walk into the tuition world just assuming it'll all be absolutely tickety-boo. It won't. Every industry in the world has rogue traders. Okay, and industries that have loose regulation tend to have more rogue traders. So you have to do your homework. And again, sorry there's no battle royale between Lucy and I. We are going to agree quite a lot, if not for the entire lecture. So do your homework. Look up these tutors. They should be asking you why you're doing the tuition. And I really hope some of the independents will walk away if they think that they shouldn't be there because you're asking them to do homework or you're asking them to get their uh, highly dyslexic and not very uh, academic child into Eton where he will probably not have a very nice time. There are very dyslexic kids at Eton who do have a very nice time, but you know, there are occasions when you need to know. Tutors are not schools consultants. They do not tend to know anything about schools, apart from what theirs was like three years previously, and only theirs, okay? Even in my world of consultancy now, there are lots of consultants who don't know enough about the schools that they're recommending, okay? I, this is the show itself is a sister company of our consultancy company, so I can prove it quite easily, but others can't. So again, if you're going down that road of advice, ask your consultants. How are they choosing these schools? Why? What do they know? Who do they know there? When was the last time they went to visit? It's a 
really important questions that you would probably ask your car dealer, but for some reason, quite a lot of people forget to ask educational advisors or tutors. Okay? Um, I, will, uh, I will finish and just say that where we might not be completely on the same page with the tuition is that schools, no matter how expensive and how private, by and large, during classes, it is a group, will be a very small group, but a group deal. And there will always be a little improvement that can be gained because your child will have a very specific problems that will not necessarily be shared by the class and there may not be the extra additional support from the school because they may not have the time which is totally normal it's not a criticism at all to do that so you will always be able to get a, a little extra I, I believe this is not a fact this is an opinion at home but you just be careful with it it is not for every day if you tutor just because your neighbor does and if you do it from Monday to Friday I promise you, whatever you think is going on the tutor is telling you, you will be creating, without knowing it, an unmotivated, highly dependent learner. And you just watch what happens when they go to university and tuition stops. It will not go well. The first thing we say to our tutors when we hire them is get fired as fast as possible. You've been hired to do a job. It should be specific, you should be a victim of your own success. When you fixed said problem with GCSE higher mathematics, do the right thing and excuse yourself. And leave that child to get on with it on their own. Thank you very much.